Thank you, Dave, and thank you to you all for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at my first seminary on Saturday, and I've heard uh, only good things about this event, and it's a delight for me to <clears throat> speak to you all this morning. Uh, our topic is the a corpus of literature in the Bible that is, I think for many, one of the more unfamiliar portions of scripture, the wisdom literature, and my goal, really in my, my three talks this morning, is, is to orient you to the basic message of these books, but then also show you how each of them in their own unique way heralds the Christ who is the center of scripture. and may only be r- rightly and properly interpreted when we understand them through the, the lens of Christ as their fulfillment. <clears throat> And we're going to begin with uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs receives uh, in pulpits and in classrooms surprisingly little attention. And I say surprisingly because the book of Proverbs treats topics that are eminently practical. Right? You read through the book of Proverbs and you'll find practical everyday advice uh, re- regarding issues of marriage right? Work, relationship, friendship, money management, child rearing, sexuality, emotional health, right? This is the stuff of the self-help section in bookstores, what used to be bookstores. Now, Amazon, the self-help tab. Proverbs is refreshing, I think, in this regard, isn't it? It's refreshing in its simplicity, speaks in a fairly straightforward manner, especially in contrast to what you might think of as the ritual jargon of, say, the book of Leviticus, or compared to the prophets and the strange speech of the prophetic corpus. Perhaps you're familiar with Martin Luther's famous quote about the prophets, that they, quote, have a strange way of speaking. I don't know if you've ever thought that about the prophets. Well, in contrast, you get into the proverbial literature, do you find as material that's fairly easily understandable. Proverbs 12, 11 says, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Do you know what this means? It means that whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, <laughs> and if he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. It's fairly straightforward. And it's perhaps for this reason that abridged versions of the Bible include the the, the New Testament, the Psalms, and what else? The Proverbs. The Proverbs. On the other hand, however, when we dig a little deeper into the Proverbs, we find that it does present a number of challenges and difficulties. And these challenges and difficulties uh, may make the neglect of Proverbs then unsurprising. What first strikes us as this refreshing simplicity can on further reflection strike us as simplistic. In Proverbs 16.3, we read, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Seems clear enough. It seems like a pious approach to life, but is this reality? Let me ask you younger folk here in school, is this how you approach your exams? Commit to the Lord. Whatever you do and your plans will succeed. No need to study. Just commit it to the Lord. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. Again, perfectly clear, but how can we affirm this? Knowing of the suffering and death of our brothers and sisters at the hands of, for example, Muslim extremists. Brothers and sisters who fear the Lord However, whose fear of the Lord does not appear to prolong their life, but seems to hasten their death. In what sense is this proverb true? Furthermore, the wicked in many parts of the world, by all appearances, seem to be prospering. And so I believe that the proverbs leave many with the haunting suspicion that what we have here are pious sentiments, which at the end of the day are of little value for us in our complex lives. Life is complex. And the Proverbs, if not understood correctly, can sound simplistic. Furthermore, Proverbs can at times 
sound arcane. Dealing with issues that are not even remotely relevant to our lives. Proverbs 30, verse 10, do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be held guilty. The dynamics at work in this proverb are quite foreign to our, our experience. Involving, as they do, notions of power, the power of speech, what is a curse, the dynamics of master and servant relationship. Other proverbs strike us as obvious, so obvious that you wonder why anyone felt the need to write it down. Proverbs uh, 21.8, the way of the guilty is crooked, but the conduct of the pure is upright. And yet still others seem to tread the line of morality, if not cross over it altogether. Proverbs 17.8, a bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Do you want to prosper? Give bribes. How do we understand these Proverbs? There's one more difficulty I'd like to point out. It's, it was once suggested to me by my, my well-meaning mother that the uh, Proverbs... I don't know if you've noticed this, has 31 chapters, and many of our months have 31 days. You see where she's going with this, right? Wouldn't it be a good idea if we make a habit of reading one chapter of Proverbs a day? And I, I, I tried this at my, my mother's uh, advice, and after a few days, the experience is of reading a lot of Proverbs, but walking away without any Proverbs. They sort of wash over you. If you're anything like me, reading a chapter of Proverbs, you'll walk away remembering uh, very few of them, Uh, much less the 30 or 40 sayings that make up an average chapter. There's a lack of clear organization to the sayings. There's little sense of progression. And so the Proverbs require, in some respects, a a fundamentally different reading strategy than much of the other biblical literature, where you might read a a chapter or two chapters in a day. However, despite such difficulties, the biblical wisdom literature comes to us at the end of the day as God's word. It has been universally recognized as God's word by, by God's church, and so as we, as we come across difficulties, as we note difficulties with the wisdom literature, we can do so with the assurance that any problems we have are ultimately problems with us. That difficulties with the Proverbs are invitations to wrestle with the meaning of Proverbs. Because the simplicity of the problem, Proverbs, as we will see, is really just an illusion. Biblical Proverbs, like all Proverbs, which stand the test of time, but especially the Biblical Proverbs, reward careful attention and careful reflection, and they often reveal greater depths and insight into reality than their initial simplicity may suggest. And wisdom, the Bible teaches, is critical. It's critical. It's not an optional extra that can be added to the Christian life for those who are super spiritual, the sort of icing on the cake of one's spiritual life. On the contrary, Proverbs throughout testify to the critical role wisdom plays in the life of the believer. The Proverbs come to us as God's word and by their own, own testimony, bear a message that is a message of life and death. Proverbs 132, Lady Wisdom declares, for the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me, she says, will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. And so the church of Christ must hear and heed the wisdom that is offered in the Proverbs. Proverbs says it's a matter of life and death. And so today, what I want to do is give you an overview of the proverbial wisdom, focusing especially on the function of Proverbs in our lives as individuals, in our lives as communities. But then answering the question in particular, how is it that Christ comes as the fulfillment of the book of Proverbs? But first, let's answer the question, what is wisdom? 
What do we mean when we, we speak of wisdom? Wisdom in the West tends to refer to a sort of intellectual acumen, right? Wisdom has to do with someone who's smart or intelligent or savvy. To be wise refers to an intellectual quality. However, the word wisdom in the Bible is not so much an intellectual competency as much as a practical competency. It refers to practical skill. It can be skill in art. It can be skill in craftsmanship. It can be skill in politics. Uh, For example, Exodus 31.3, God says of Bezalel. Remember Bezalel? One of the craftsmen building the tabernacle. God says of Bezalel, Bezalel, I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to design artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze. Wisdom is practical. And what this means is that wisdom is gained through practice, through observation, through trial, sometimes through trial and error. Uh, But what this also means is that wisdom can't merely be obtained by reading books. This pains me to say because I love books, but they have their limits, right? There are things in life that you just can't learn from a book. Uh, My wife is a potter, right? Uh, Throws pottery on a wheel. She could read every book on pottery ever published, right? From the, the ancient world to the present, we have instructions on pottery, She could know every theory of pottery in the world, but if she never puts her hand on clay, she doesn't really know how to throw a pot. And there's only so much you can learn from the books. You need to sit next to an instructor, a master potter, and have him or her take your hands and say, no, not like this, like that. You need to press harder here, hold your thumb like that, push down like this. It's only by doing it and by doing it over and over and over again that she could ever hope to obtain any skill or competency or what the Bible would call wisdom in pottery. The famous Old Testament scholar, Gerhard von Rad, famously described wisdom as the skill at living. Skill at living. How do we live well? How do we navigate the creation in such a way that we thrive in our lives? Uh, The answer the Proverbs gives us is this, get wisdom. Whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. To live wisely, you see, is to bring your life in conformity to the order of things. The creation as God has designed it, the creation as God has established it, I think the Perhaps the most crucial text in Proverbs uh, in this regard is Proverbs 3, starting at verse 19. Because here we read that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open. The clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. Do you see what he's saying here? When he says that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens, what he's saying is that wisdom was the instrument of God's creation. Right? The way a mason might use a, a hammer or a chisel, God used wisdom and he wove wisdom into the very fabric of creation. God established an order so that a wise person, upon discovering that order and conforming his or her life to that order, might do so in a way that they can order their own lives for the good. Just as there's a a physical order to the universe, that that if you transgress, you will experience right, uh, death and destruction. Right? If you were to step out off the top of this beautiful church here, you will very quickly learn something about the physical laws of the universe. Right? 
Uh, so too, what Proverbs says is that God has woven spiritual laws into the universe, relational laws into creation, right? Emotional, psychological, economic. In Proverbs 6, 27, the father's warning his son against the temptation of an adulterous woman. And he says, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? In the same way that you cannot expect to carry a match under your shirt, right, without experiencing some, some degree of harm or discomfort, so too you could not go into an adulterous woman, the father is saying to his son, and not expect to experience the death or the destruction, the pain and the sorrow of transgressing the created order. When the proverb speaks about life, and this is, this is critical, it's not just speaking about biological life. It's, it's not less than biological life, but it's much more. Life in Proverbs is life as God intended it for his human creation, a life of abundance, a life of joy, a life of peace and blessing. And similarly, its opposite, death, refers not just to bi- the biological cessation of, of life, brain function, it refers to want or alienation in relationship or disorder in one's life. And the conformity of our lives to the order or pattern of creation, recognizing God as the one who established and sustains that order. It's in this that we come to know in this life, the proverb says, in this life and on into the next, the peace and the blessing which is the reward of wisdom. Now, why do we need wisdom? That's what wisdom is. Why do we need it? Uh, For some time in the 19th century and into the the 20th century, there was a a liberal notion that what we have in the Proverbs is uh, a reflection of simple and primitive modes of thought. Right? That when we read things like, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Uh, what we have here is the sort of, uh, sort of uh, primitive man's thinking about uh, how to avoid danger. Uh, this widespread notion of the Proverbs reflecting sort of the primitive mind is thankfully being overturned today uh, as we, we root our understanding of Proverbs in the nature and function of Proverbs themselves. Because when understood properly, what you find is not only that Proverbs are not simplistic, but actually Proverbs are the best means of accomplishing what they were meant to accomplish. What were they meant to accomplish? They were meant to accomplish the passing on of wisdom from one generation to the the next. The preserving and inculcating of the wisdom within a society and culture and giving that to the next generation. And proverbial wisdom has the capacity to shape character. It shapes character and it cultivates certain values of individuals and it cultivates values within a community. You see, Proverbs were designed, are designed to sink deep into the bones of a culture and shape the collective consciousness of a community. And for this reason, there's a very real sense in which proverbial living therefore, is inevitable. Aristotle once said famously that man, that man is a political creature. We could also say that man is a proverbial creature. The question isn't, will I live according to proverbial wisdom or not, but which proverbial wisdom will I live by? Will it accord with the fabric of creation or won't it? The truth is that we all value something don't we? We all belong to a variety of communities, all of which have deeply embedded values. Families, churches, schools, clubs, friends. And as we reflect on the biblical Proverbs, there is a call to consider how they compare with the proverbial wisdom of our various communities and cultures. Now we could ask ourselves, where do we find proverbial wisdom in our culture? And of course, we could go uh, immediately to a well-known American Proverbs, 
right? In his Poor Richard's Almanac, Benjamin Franklin has given us many quintessentially American proverbs. There are no gains without pains, says Franklin, which has been shortened even further to no pain, no gain. There's proverbial wisdom in that expression, right? He that lies down with dogs rises up with fleas. Success has ruined many a man. The early bird gets the worm. Look before you leap. However, when it comes to, I think, the, the, the deep character-shaping influence, we would do better to turn to other sources of short, pithy sayings that capture the imagination. Where do we find short, pithy, memorable sayings that capture the imagination? Marketing. You invited professors to speak. You, I'm sure you expected to get a test. So we're going to go ahead with a, a pop quiz and I'm going to give you the slogan, and you're going to tell me what it's from. Okay? Image is everything. Nikon. Close, not Nikon. Canon. Canon. Image is everything. That's really clever. It's a, it's a camera. But does that not capture something of American values? Right? That image is everything. Uh, Because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. it, No, no, because you're worth it. I'm glad that L'Oreal, you got it. L'Oreal, makeup, because you're worth it. There are certain values in in that slogan. it, It both reflects American values, Western values in many respects, but American values, it it. It reflects it, but it also cultivates it. Do you see how there's a a sort of dialectic there? It serves to strengthen or inculcate, shore up those values. Okay, here, American by birth, rebel by choice. Harley Davidson. I mean, does it get any more American than that? American by birth, rebel by choice. Uh, Make believe. Make believe, two words. Sony. Yet it does capture so much of Uh, of life in modern American culture. Uh, The encouragement to make believe, the miracles of science, DuPont. And finally, the most successful slogan in the history of marketing, as I'm led to understand by the internet, so it can't be wrong. Um, uh, What happens here stays here. Las Vegas. Think about how Uh, the philosophy, the theology, the anthropology, the various ethics that are wrapped up into those one, two, three, four, five words. You could think of music slogans for the sake of time. I won't walk you through those. You could think of movies. How many movies, how many movies, how many movies at some point express the basic message, follow your heart, right? at some point, I think in most movies, you're giving this, giving this message, just follow your heart. And whether we are conscious of it or not, these messages shape our character. And they shape our communities. They shape our values. They shape our priorities. They influence our decision making. Proverbial wisdom is in this respect inevitable. It's also critical. Proverbial wisdom is critical. It's critical because wisdom addresses issues in life where what you might think of as the biblical laws don't apply, right? Most of life's decisions are not addressed by the law of God. That is by the explicit commands or prohibitions of God. The Bible does have many prescriptions and proscriptions, certainly. But try as you might, you will not find an explicit answer to questions like, who should I marry? Should I I take this job? Should I go to this university or that university? When should I retire? What school should I attend? How should I spend my money? How should I spend my free time? Certainly the Bible offers general instructions on all of these matters. But it doesn't offer explicit commands for any of them. 
Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 7 that when we marry, we must marry in the Lord. And this is helpful as far as it goes. But the Bible never told me to marry my dear wife, Carrie. Carrie, as it happens, told me to marry Carrie. But, <laughs> but God never did. He doesn't tell us to go to this college or that university. These decisions, however, are not morally neutral. Right? We are required, commanded to make a wise decision. It's, it's striking in 1 Kings 3 that the young Solomon is commended by God for asking for a wise and discerning mind. God doesn't say to Solomon, I've given you Torah. What else do you need? Just follow Torah. God commends Solomon because Solomon realizes that the demands of kingship and the decisions that he will have to face are such that he's going to need more than Torah. He's going to need wisdom. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Here I believe we have the heart of wisdom as an ethical category. That all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. So much of wisdom gets down to making decisions between what is good or better and better and best. The Bible commands us to make the best decision in every situation. Gain a wise and discerning mind so that you're able to make not just a good decision, but what is best not just what, is, what am I allowed to say in this uh, situation, but what would be best to say? And when we think of wisdom then as an ethical category, as a, a basis for decision-making, uh, I think we, uh, we, we have an answer to many of the difficult questions that we face as individuals, but also in churches, in Christian communities. Because when you lack wisdom as an ethical category, your only basis for making a decision is law. And the, the, the sad result for the church has been Christians prescribing behavior that are really a matter of wisdom. You could think of matters such as what we watch on television or film, or if we watch television or film. You could think matters of, about matters of drinking alcohol or smoking or diet or schooling. Do we put our kids in, in public school or private school or home school? In my, in my pastoral ministry, I had sincere Christians make an argument to, to me that each one of these options, private, home school, public school, was the only way, the only option for true Christians. Wisdom then offers us a, a, a category of ethical reflection and decision-making that addresses the vast majority of decisions we make in life. And it enables us to be able to say, well, this is wise for me and for my family, but something for your, you and your family, uh, something else might be wise. Um, third, how do Proverbs work? How do they work? Now, Cervantes once defined a, a proverb as, quote, a short sentence founded on long experience. Uh, proverbs are typically short. Uh, then they're short so that they can be remembered and accessed quickly. Right? They're, they're typically elegant or clever in their construction. They're sometimes funny or shocking. Uh, proverbs 11.22, like a gold ring in, the, in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. It's vivid, it's humorous, it's shocking, it's instructive. All of this in an effort to describe reality and to capture the world as it is. And so they describe the world as it is in order to encourage proper, wise behavior. And what we learn from this is that Proverbs are not promises. That's important, that Proverbs are not promises. Though they describe the way the world typically works, they are not promises that this is how the world will always work. Countless parents whose covenant children have rejected the faith have pointed to Proverbs 22.6. 
and said, where did I go wrong? Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right here, here's a proverb describing the, the character, the, the habits cultivated or formed in youth persisting into older age. If this proverb is read as a promise, it could be potentially crushing for faithful, godly parents. His child uh, has gone astray. It is not always the case. It's not always the case that our bad habits determine our future. This proverb is saying that our bad habits formed in youth typically do determine our future. So be careful. Be careful how you train up your children. But if this proverb is read as a promise, it could unnecessarily crush otherwise faithful parents. Uh, Proverbs seek to present true things about the world, but they never suggest that they're presenting the whole truth. They would have a difficult time on the witness stand. Do you promise to tell the truth? Yes, the whole truth. They'd say, wait a minute, I'm just a proverb. How much could you say in a sentence, really? (laughs) And so a wise man, a wise woman, throughout the book of Proverbs is portrayed as someone who doesn't just know Proverbs, but he knows how to apply the Proverbs. He knows which proverb is appropriate for this particular situation. And this is why we have so many Proverbs about the danger of misusing Proverbs. Proverbs 26.9 says, like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. In the mouth of a fool, a proverb is useless. Proverbs need to be translated into practice. And practice has to be in the right way, at the right time. We know this from our own utilization of American proverbs. We have the proverb, too many cooks spoil the broth. Right? Too many cooks spoil the broth, of course, indicating that the accumulation of labor and opinions tend to ruin what would otherwise be a successful endeavor. And yet we also have the proverb that many hands make light work. A wise person is one who not only knows both of these proverbs, but knows which is appropriate and fitting in a given situation. Is this an occasion in which many hands would make for lighter work or for a lousy dinner? Which is it? Perhaps the parade example of this in the book of, of Proverbs is the instance of opposing Proverbs placed next to each other in Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, 4, we read, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. But then Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. I hear the sages intentionally juxtapose these, these competing Proverbs in order to confront us with the demands of wisdom, that it must be applied correctly. We need to be able to discern, is this a a, a situation in which I should answer a fool according to his folly, lest he's going to be wise in his own eyes, or should I hold my tongue? Because entering into such an argument, I would become like the fool himself. Now to do this, we need to know biblical wisdom. As one of my seminary professors once said that when a proverb is needed, you don't have time to go to your shelf, right, and look up a proverb. Proverbs need to become second nature. And for that to happen, they need to be memorized. They need to be memorized and meditated upon so that our character becomes more and more shaped by them. They need to become memorized so that they become a part of who we are, so that we can put them into practice. Knowing that as we consciously put them into practice, we will gain greater and greater reflexes in making wise decision. This cannot happen overnight. In the same way, my wife would tell you, you can't learn pottery overnight. It takes weeks and months and years of developing certain muscles in your finger. If musicians in here, it's the same. You know from playing stringed instruments, you can't learn to play the violin overnight. It takes practice, but it's through that practice of wisdom that you can become confident that you will 
uh, become more and more wise in the future, making wise decisions will become increasingly second nature. Well, then lastly, finally, and most importantly, where do we find the gospel in all of this? Where do we find the gospel in all of this? The charge that's often leveled against the book of Proverbs is that there is little that is distinctively Israelite about it. Uh, There is certainly some truth in this. There is little connection to the unfolding of redemptive history in the book of Proverbs. There's no explicit mention of the covenants that God made with Israel. There even seems to be some clear borrowing of wisdom sayings from other cultures like, like Egypt. However, this view goes too far in statements like this made by the great Old Testament scholar John Bright. He once wrote that some parts of the Old Testament are far less clearly uh, expressive of Israel's distinctive understanding of reality than others. Some parts, and one thinks of such books as Proverbs, seem to be only peripherally related to it, while others, for example, Ecclesiastes, even questions its essential features. The wisdom literature, in other words, is a somewhat alien body, these scholars are saying, uh, to the biblical uh, vision. The problem here is that Proverbs, with, when it comes to the book of Proverbs, is that you do run up against certain realities that are distinctively Israelite. Proverbs 21.3, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. How many of Israel's prophets said the same thing? However, I think more fundamentally, this view fails to note the significance of the major character in the book of Proverbs. Who's the major character in the book of Proverbs? It's not the father or the son to whom he's speaking. It's Yahweh. It's the Lord. It's the fear of Yahweh, we're told in Proverbs 1.7, that is the beginning of wisdom. This order of creation that we've been speaking about, when I say we, I mean mostly me, But this order of creation is available for observation and available for reflection and available for assessment. This order is an order that's been established by God. And this is the God, all creation, Elohim, but it's the same God who covenanted himself to a people and revealed himself as Yahweh, the covenant-making and covenant-keeping Lord. And what we observe throughout the Bible, what we observe throughout our own experience, is that it is certainly possible to recognize the order of creation and to even in an outward way conform our lives to the order of creation without there being a heart that acknowledges the Lord of creation. That's possible. And it's also tragic. And it's precisely this tragedy that we see in perhaps the principal patron of wisdom in the Bible, don't we? King Solomon. Now Solomon was clearly able to recognize wisdom, but he lacked the fear of the Lord and so ultimately was unable to profit from it. Uh, What we see in Solomon is that it is possible to recognize wisdom and to live in an outward way according to the path of wisdom. But if wisdom is not connected to a heart of faith that knows the source of wisdom, it will prove to be of no ultimate or lasting value. And so how is it that we gain a heart for wisdom? Well, Proverbs itself teaches us that it cannot be earned It cannot ultimately be achieved through any wise behavior on our own part. Ultimately, it comes as a gift from God, a gift graciously given. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Uh, Similarly, James tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him all the wisdom that we have and all the benefits that we enjoy are ultimately gifts from God. And this in no way nullifies our own efforts as we're told throughout Proverbs that it is our responsibility to seek wisdom. Absolutely, seek wisdom, get wisdom, pursue her. 
like we would pursue the riches, the greatest riches or the most lovely of women. And yet we enjoy, as we enjoy any success in this endeavor, any success at all, we do so in the sure knowledge that our wisdom has come to us as a generous gift from our Father who gives generously and without reproach. Now, one of the characteristics of wisdom is that it divides humanity into distinct categories. You have the wise and the fool. And it divides life up into distinct categories. You have the road that leads to life and the road that leads to death. But we need to remember as we read Proverbs that this is only a way of construing reality. Uh, It serves a rhetorical effect. It serves a heuristic effect. It serves to call us to a life of wisdom, to understand the promises of wisdom. But the fact is that each of us in this room, more often than we'd like to admit, have taken the crooked path. We've taken the path that would lead to death rather than the straight path that leads to life. Each of us have made foolish and unwise decisions. Uh, But like the law, wisdom was never meant to be a way of making ourselves acceptable to God. Uh, For this, as one pastor put it so wonderfully, one greater than Solomon is needed. To be wise, we must have one who is wise on our behalf and to bear the strokes that belong to us as the foolish. As Proverbs 19.29 declares, condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of fools. Uh, In his human life, the Son of God grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Throughout his ministry, Jesus constantly astounded the crowds with his insight. We're told in Mark 6, 2, that on the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And so too, Jesus declared in Luke eleven thirty one, 31, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And so in our reflection and in our meditation on proverbial wisdom, you are never done the task of interpretation until you ask the question, how is Christ good news for such a fool? How is Christ good news? How is Christ good news for, for sluggards? We read in Proverbs 26, 15, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. He's so lazy. Christ was never a sluggard. Christ was never lazy, not one day. He never put aside his responsibility. Rather, he declares in John 5, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. In Mark 14, we read how Jesus' disciples could not even be bothered to stay awake at Jesus' greatest hour of need. Simon, are you asleep, Jesus asks. Could you not, could you not watch one hour? For those who are united to Christ by faith, the good news is that Christ is not only God's wisdom to us, he's also God's wisdom for us. Dr. Gardner later is going to speak on 1 Corinthians 1. So I'm not going to develop this point at great length. I'll only read you Paul's wonderful words that he writes to the Corinthian church in which he says that God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus Him God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it is not only Christ's perfect law keeping that is imputed to the believer, but it's also Christ's wisdom. That every time we've been fools, Christ has been wise for us. And so ultimately, ultimately, our hope For the life that is promised in the Proverbs is not going to be based on our wisdom, but on Christ who lived for us and died for us. Thank you very much.